Hi, um, this is my summary of Plato's Republic. Uh, there's a little colour um, key just there, so the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, before I begin, I just want to firstly apologise because I've got a slight uh, cold, so if I cough or have a bit of a sore throat, that's that's why. Uh, and secondly, there have been a number of comments saying that the quality of the voice recording isn't very good, um, which is true. It's because this is just my revision for for my degree, so I'm not you know I haven't paid for expensive equipment. This is literally just my laptop and my headphones. So apologies for that, but um, you know that's the way it is. Okay, so um, let's begin Plato's Republic. So book one um, begins with Socrates, who's the the pr- principal character, through which um, we kind of we we see Plato's thoughts and Plato's uh imaginings um so when i refer to socrates who is who is a character because because this is a dialogue that's typically what plato is the voice of plato um or the narrative voice so he says that he went to piraeus yesterday with glaucon to offer a prayer and watch the festival on the way home they were spotted by polymarchus who was with adamantus and some others uh, and so polymarchus and, and such convinced them to stay at the festival uh, and one persuasive factor that they use is that there will be a torch race on horseback. They go back to Polymarchus's house. Um, other people are there, including Thrasymachus and Cephalus. Socrates and Cephalus talk about old age and then wealth. Um, and Socrates says, and that's why I attach the greatest importance to the possession of money. And this conversation brings up the issue of justice. And, and this is where the, the sort of real discussion begins. Justice is the central theme of the book. So Socrates proposes a simple definition, justice is truthfulness and returning anything you may have received from anyone else. Um, Then they question, is it sometimes right to act in this way and sometimes wrong? For example, if you lent weapons to a friend and then he later went mad and asked for them back again, it would be wrong to return them to him. And therefore, this can't be the definition of justice. Polymarchus disagrees. Um, He says that according to Simonides, the poet, this aforementioned definition is justice. Cephalus removes himself from the discussion and Polymarchus takes up the baton. Simonides says that it is just to pay everyone what is owed to him. Socrates says that Simonides is a wise man but must mean something different. What is due to friends will surely be different from what is due to enemies. Therefore helping your friends and harming your enemies is justice. Uh, an example is, while a doctor is only useful in illness and a ship's captain in sea voyages, a just man is useful in both war and peace. Is justice the art of stealing? Polymarchus says no, but is unsure what he thinks now. Um, so this is the aporia, um, which is the typical result of a Socratic dialogue. Um, so a state of confusion and you know inability to, to know what is what. Um, so he says, yeah, he, he's unsure what he thinks now, other than the fact that justice is treating friends well and enemies badly. Um, he defines friends as the people each individual believes to be good, not necessarily those that are good. It is therefore just to treat the good poorly and the bad well because everyone makes mistakes. Um, so they decide that they must change the definition. So a friend is someone who both is good and seems to be good. In the same way that if we treat a horse badly, it becomes worse by the standard we use to judge horses. And if we treat a dog badly, it becomes worse by the standard we use to judge dogs. By the standard we use to judge human excellence, humans become worse when treated badly. They then ask, isn't justice a human excellent? And therefore, humans that are treated badly become more unjust. This doesn't make sense, though, because a just person using the justice well cannot decrease the justice in another in the same way that musicians can't make people unmusical through their music. It is not the property of heat to make things cold, but the property of its opposite. In that case, Polymarchus, it it is not the property of the just man to treat his friend or anyone else badly. It is the property of his opposite, the unjust man. And so this this argument has developed from saying that justice is treating friends, uh, i.e. good people, well, and enemies, i.e. bad people, poorly, to now saying, well, actually, any 
just person does not treat anyone badly because they will therefore decrease the justice of that person and so that will be an unjust act. Uh, yeah, so the definitions of justice provided thus far are wrong. What else could it be defined as? Throughout this conversation, Thrasymachus has repeatedly tried to intervene, but had been silenced by the other listeners. He now jumps in, criticising the Socratic method, and challenges Socrates to provide his own definition. He says, You know perfectly well it's easier to ask questions than to give answers. So this brings on a dispute about Socrates' methods of questioning and analogies. And finally, Thrasymachus gives his own definition. I say that justice is simply what is good for the stronger. To exemplify this, he says that there are tyrannies, democracies and aristocracies. And what is control in each city is the ruling power. Every ruling power makes laws for its own good, not, not food, sorry. Um, and this defines justice in each city. So because justice is a legal thing, uh, his argument is that it's whatever the laws are made in a certain city. So justice depends on the city, in which case it is justice is whatever the ruling element decides because they are the, the people who decide the laws and therefore justice is what is good for the stronger, i.e. the rulers. Socrates argues that rulers are capable of making mistakes and therefore are capable of enacting laws that are not in their own interest. But this would still be defined as justice in their city. Thrasymachus defends his argument, saying that when the ruler is making the mistake, he is not actually the stronger for that moment. The most precise answer is, in fact, that the ruler, to the extent that he is a ruler, does not make mistakes. And since he does not make mistakes, he does enact what is best for him, and this is what his subject must carry out. <coughs> Sorry. So Socrates leads to the conclusion that there is no branch of knowledge which thinks about or prescribes what is good for the stronger, but only for what is under its control, the weaker. For example, horsemanship doesn't think about what is good for horsemanship, but what is good for horses. Thrasymachus reluctantly agrees. However, he argues that the rulers are like shepherds, fattening up their sheep and just thinking about what good they will derive from them. The just man, one who obeys the laws, does what is good for the stronger, and so the conclusion is that it is always more fruitful and beneficial to be unjust because justice is for something that isn't for you, it's for someone who is stronger than you, whereas unjust is based on your own interests, according to Thrasymachus. And the best example of this is tyranny. Thrasymachus tried to leave um, this discussion, but was forced to stay and explain himself further. Socrates uses the examples of medicine, seamanship and house beating, house building to conclude that no art or skill and no power or authority provides what is beneficial for itself. The only benefit is being paid. Glaucon says that he thinks the life of the just is more profitable. They go and ask the Symmachus to make his case more fully, and, and so his case is that it's more it's um, more beneficial to be unjust. He argues that the unjust man is wise and good. Uh, he talks about perfect injustice, i.e. tyranny, not petty, petty thievery. Socrates disputes this and forces Thrasymachus to agree. The just man is wise. A city can be unjust, and when a city becomes more powerful than another, it is with the aid of injustice. It was it is sorry, it is with the aid of justice because justice is wisdom. Injustice, wherever it appears, causes faction, and therefore is not more powerful. Socrates concludes that everything with a specific function also has its own specific excellent for ex excellence. For example, the eyes and the ears. The soul has the function of decision-making and living, and the, so justice is an excellence of the soul. In which case, the just soul and the just man will have a good life and the unjust a bad one. Socrates notes that while they have come to this conclusion, they have abandoned the pursuit of a definition of justice. They've, they've only decided whether it's good or bad to be just. So in book two, Glaucon takes up the charge, saying he isn't convinced that it's always better to be just. He says there is a good of the kind we choose because of its own sake, not for the desire of its results. And there are goods that we value both for themselves and their effects. And there is a third class of good, which we value just for the results, but find the actual process unpleasant, for example, physical exercise. Socrates agrees. So Socrates puts justice in the class of good that is valued both for itself and for its consequences. But Glaucon says that most people would put it in the third unpleasant class, i.e., 
something that's good because we value it for its results, but not itself. Glaucon says that doing wrong is a good and being wronged an evil. And so men who experience both come to agreements and do neither evil, do neither as the evil outweighs the good. They say that this is the origin and essential nature of justice, that it is a compromise. And therefore justice being placed in between two extremes is not a good, but has value in the people's want of power to do wrong. So the, so the idea of this is that justice is something we reluctantly contract to do with other people through laws because we don't want them to do evil to us and they don't want us to do evil to them. And so it's not something that's good in itself. It's something that is a mean in the middle of two extremes. Glaucon tells a story about a magic invisibility ring to show that nobody is just voluntarily. So the, so the idea of the magical invisibility ring is that someone, if you can put this, this ring on and become invisible, and so no one knows that you're being unjust, you would be unjust because you would not suffer any of the negative consequences and you would gain things from it. So you, you might steal or, you know, whatever. And, and the only reason you don't do these things is because you will get caught and suffer consequences. And therefore, he, he argues that justice isn't good in itself because we only do it reluctantly. So he declares that it's only good to appear to be just, not necessarily to be just. After Glaucon finishes, Adamantus, who is his brother, adds to his argument. He talks about the reputational benefits of appearing to be just. Everyone only praises justice in terms of the reputation, prestige and rewards it brings. And so he challenges Socrates to recommend justice for its own value. Socrates praises the brothers for their oratorical skills and says he doesn't know how to proceed because he can't defend justice because of their impressive rebuttal of all his arguments. But he can't not defend justice. The other is encourage him to make a full investigation into what justice and injustice are and then to defend them. And this is where Socrates proposes the city soul analogy. And again, here we, we step into another element of the, the central aspect of the Republic. So he says um, that they are they are men with poor eyesight trying to read some small writing at a distance. And it's, it will be useful then to use a larger copy of the same writing to help them understand. We say that there is justice in an individual, but also, I take it, justice in a whole city. In that case, maybe justice will be on a larger scale in what is larger and easier to find out about. And therefore, their next enterprise will be to discover justice in a city. So this is the reason that Plato discusses a, a city and discusses what is a good political situation. Um, it's all to find what justice means and then apply that to an individual. So now we, we move on to the political theory and the establishment of Callipolis, the ideal city. The origins of a city lies... In, I think, in the fact that we are not any of us self-sufficient. So individuals form associations to f fulfil their needs, and this becomes a city. The primary need is food, second is housing, and third is clothing. Clothing. Therefore, the city needs a farmer, a builder, and a weaver. But it'll also need a shoemaker uh, and, and various other people. Um, so a basic city would consist of about four to five men. It makes sense for each individual to use their skill for everyone, rather than develop every skill for the use only for themselves. So this is the doctrine of specialisation, which is again central to platonic political theory. Um, so for example, an individual will be better concentrating on one skill, they'll, they'll develop that skill um, to a better degree and they'll be more efficient and so therefore produce more. Um, and this also links to the later conclusion that justice equals staying in your own lane, um, sticking to what you're good at, or what you are meant to do. Because of this doctrine, however, it follows that the city will need more people, as the farmer will not make himself his own plough, um, etc. Et also, it will be nearly impossible to lo locate the city somewhere in which it wouldn't need imports. Therefore, even more people are necessary, including merchants and seafarers. Internal trade will give rise to a marketplace and currency, so that requires dealers. 
um, Glaucon interrupts this and calls it a city of pigs. He asks them to develop a more luxurious city, um, one that is more realistic and relatable to Athenians. So Socrates adds things like couches and cool girls and art and enlarges the city even further. He then says that the city will need more territory too, as it's as it's growing so much, so they must carve ourselves a slice of our neighbour's territory. He recognises that the neighbours may well have the same problem, and this is where he locates the origin of war. So now, because of this war, they required an army to defend the city. It must be a military caste, um, according to the doctrine of specialisation, so people can't be farmers and soldiers, they must just be soldiers. Since the Guardian's job, then, is the most important, it must correspondingly call for the greatest freedom from other activities, and the Guardians are the military caste. So the Guardians must also have a natural disposition for the military. They should be spirited and energetic in order to stop themselves from being aggressive towards another, one another. They must also be lovers of wisdom, um, something he calls philosophers. So one of my theories about the Republic it is that is that it is an ongoing defence of philosophy. Um, there'll be more about that later, but I think it's important to note that he, when he introduces the Guardians, he makes it clear that they are lovers of wisdoms or philosophers, and they are sort of the, the pinnacle of this new society. He compares the Guardians to dogs because they are aggressive to people who they don't know, even though they've never been mistreated by them, and welcoming to those who they do know, even if they have been mistreated by them. And this shows a true love of wisdom or knowledge. They decide that they must look into the education of the Guardians. Current sort of contemporary Athenian education begins with false stories in legends and music and poetry. But they don't want their children listening to any old stories. Therefore, they must be approved stories. And he counts both Hesiod and Homer in the category of false stories. So Plato is consistently anti-art or at least anti the sort of art that isn't fully true. Um, and he says, we must reject most of the stories that they tell at the moment. Adamantus queries what sort of stories they should tell the children. And Socrates says that they are not poets, but that they should always give a true picture of what God is really like, i.e. not the cause of evil. So book three. Um they continue the discussion of the education of the guardians. They should also be telling stories that encourage bravery. They shouldn't be stories that breed fear, such as ones about the underworld, which makes people fear death more than slavery. Nobody should be able to tell lies other than the rulers of the city, who would do so only for the benefit of the city, according to Socrates. The poets speak through imitation, um, in a sort of free and direct discourse, and so he criticises this. Following the doctrine of specialisation, they want the guardians to be able to do one thing well, which means that they won't be versatile imitators. A decent man telling a story will imitate the good man, but will simply narrate the actions of the bad. They discuss the correct modes and rhythms of storytelling, and then discuss the physical provisions of the guardians, i.e. they shouldn't get drunk and they should have a varied and healthy diet. The rulers will come from the guardian class because these are the best people. They have to be wise, powerful and above all devoted to the city. These rulers must believe that what is in the city's best interests is also in their own. So um, Socrates and his interlocutors decide that the city requires a foundational story to explain its makeup. We want one single grand lie which will believe, be believed by everybody. And so the story is that um, the people in the city and their upbringing and education was simply just a dream. In reality, they spent that time being formed deep within the earth. Once they had been made, their earth mother released them. And so now it is their duty to defend their country, their land and their fraternal citizens. When God made them, he used different materials from the earth. Gold for those who were fit to be rulers, i.e. the guardian class. Silver for those to be auxiliaries and bronze and iron for the wool farmers and workers. Most of the time, <coughs> the people will father children of the same type as themselves. However, if they don't, they must give their child the place in society which their nature deserve, deserves. 
There is a prophecy, God tells them, that the end of the city will come when iron or bronze becomes its guardian. So not only is this a foundational story, um, an origin myth, <coughs> excuse me, it is um, actually a sort of justification and legitimization of the hierarchy that um, Plato is establishing, saying that it's natural. An interesting point is that he differs from um, Aristotle, who actually says that there is a natural hierarchy. And it seems to be that Plato is more arguing that they should convince the people that there is a natural natural hierarchy, even if there isn't. Um, but the point is, is it, it's justifying inequality. Um, in addition to a good education, the guardian class should be furnished with housing and a standard of living which helps them to become the best possible people. Um, despite this, there should be no private property beyond what is essential. So the the housing and, and food, etc. is all common. They should, they should subsist from a tax on the lower citizens and receive an annual payment, and they should live a communal life. They won't need gold or silver because that is within their soul, according to the origin story. So he argues that the guardians will only continue to being protectors of the city if they have no wealth or private property. As soon as they acquire some, they will compete with ordinary citizens and they will spend their whole lives hating and being hated, plotting and being plotted against. Now to book four. So Adamantus interrupts and asks how Socrates would respond to the charge that he's not making the guardian class happy. The city belongs to them, but they get no benefit from it. Um, and Socrates responds that our aim in founding the city is not to make one group outstandingly happy, but to make the whole city as happy as possible. So this thought experiment that, that Socrates and Adamantus and his other interlocutors are doing is to construct a complete city that is just. Um, so he compares this to painting a statue and someone criticising the artist for not using the most beautiful colours for the most beautiful parts, such as the eyes. However, giving the appropriate colours to each part would make the entire thing beautiful. Uh, so, for example, if you paint the eyes purple or bright yellow or whatever is the most beautiful colour, that would look odd when you look at the statue overall. Whereas if you paint the, the eyes blue or brown or a more natural colour, then overall the statue is going to look more believable and thus more beautiful. Plato goes to great lengths um, to present the city as one unitary anthropomorphic entity. And this reinforces the city-soul analogy because if the city is sort of one individual group, uh, not even group, one just one entity that is almost human, then the justice that we find in the city is more likely to resemble the justice in an individual. <coughs> so he, he goes to lengths to sort of establish this unitary style of city. So the guardians must present, prevent both extreme wealth and poverty, as these have detrimental effects on what the skilled workers produce. Um, luxury makes them lazy, whereas poverty makes them have mean spirit. Adamantus asks how the city, without any wealth, will afford to fight a wealthy city. And Socrates argues that the guardians will be more skilled fighters and thus will win. They could also make allies with other cities on the promise that they can get all of the treasury, treasure from victory. Um, and so all of these requirements for the guardians are trivial if they have not, um, if they have the correct education. The rulers should be adverse to change, so it's a very conservative idea. Um, so change in education, in song, etc. Uh, and then Socrates very, very briefly mentions the religious laws of the city, saying, we do not know about this kind of thing, and when we find our city, if we have any sense, the only advice we shall follow the only authority we should recognise is the traditional authority. But it's odd that he hardly mentions religion at all. 
Um, and it's quite a significant omission within the cultural context of ancient Greece in which everything is revolves around the gods. Um, so I think it's very interesting that he doesn't really focus at all on the religion of the city. Okay, so now the city is founded, they must discover justice. The city is wholly good. It is wise, courageous, self-disciplined and just. And these are Plato's four virtues. So he, he logically follows that if they can find the first three elements in the city, the fourth, justice, would ipso facto be identified in what remained. So firstly, they look at wisdom. The city has good judgment, which comes from knowledge. However, there are many types of knowledge within the city. For example, the carpenter has knowledge of carpentry, the fighters have knowledge of fighting. So which determines the wisdom of the city? It must be the branch of knowledge which makes the decisions about the city as whole. Um, and so this type of knowledge is possessed by the guardians and especially the rulers within the guardian class. The wisdom of a city founded on natural principles depends entirely on its smallest group and element, the leading and ruling element and the knowledge that element possesses. So secondly, they look at courage. This can be located in the city's defence. Courage in a city is a kind of preservation of the opinion formed by education under the influence of law about which things are to be feared. And so this, this courage is also found in the guardian class. It's that the sort of soldiers. Um, and again, it, it sent, he said he emphasises the importance of the education of the guardians. And thirdly, self-discipline. This is like a harmony, a kind of order, a mastery of pleasures and desires. In a single soul, self-discipline is the better element in control of the worst. And so in the city, uh, it's the, the better element, i.e. the guardians, in charge of the worst element, i.e. the working class. The city is self-disciplined because the better part rules the worst part. The desires of the ordinary majority are controlled by the rational and moderate desires of the discerning minority. In this city, too, there is consensus about who is best to rule. Self-discipline is not located in a particular element of the city, because it is the harmony between the two parts, the ruling and the ruled. Uh, so self-discipline is this agreement about which of them should rule, a natural harmony of worse and better, both in the city and in each individual. So now they've found the three of his four virtues, they must find justice. Socrates says that it has been lying under their noses the whole time. They've been talking about it without realising that it was justice. The principle they lay down at the start, specialisation, is justice. Justice is this business of everyone performing his own task. The remaining virtue in the city is that which gave all others the power to come into being. And so the rulers will be tasked with hearing cases in law courts and their aim will be to make sure that no class takes what belongs to another. So even the legal definition of justice in this city supports the conclusion that justice is each person sticking to their nature. Um, so he argues that a shoemaker trying to be a car carpenter won't do much harm to the city, but it is if people attempt to change classes that will cause injustice. So I think, again, this is incredibly interesting because although he argues that everyone should be specialised and, and it's unjust to do something that's not in your nature, actually, he only argues that there are... The, the, the sort of crux of it is that there are only two types of specialisation because the lower class, if they sort of switch occupation, he doesn't see that as a big deal. It's only if they try and move classes... That, that, that this is a problem. So, in it, sort of, in essence, he argues that injustice is social mobility, um, which I think is an interesting sort of adaptation of the specialisation doctrine. It's sort of it's quite a limited interpretation of that. Um, and there, the quote for evidence is: "It is the interference of our three classes with one another, then, and interchange between them." which does the greatest harm to the city. So now that they have their definition of justice, they must apply their findings to the individual and see if justice there is the same. So the just man, in his turn, simply in terms of his justice, will be no different from a just city. He will be like the just city. 
So does the individual have three elements in his soul that correspond to the three classes in the city? Passage 435e, which is a, a very pivotal passage in the scholarship, um, says, Do we have no choice but to agree that in each of us are found the same elements and characteristics as are found in the city? After all, where else could the city have got them from? And this is what has led Williams, um, one scholarly critic, to argue that the city is just if and only if its citizens are just i.e. the characteristics of the city uh, are gained from its citizens and so the justice of a city will be developed from the justice of an individual. Um, however, I and many others disagree with this because if justice is every element within you or within the city doing its own thing, then that cannot be applied to a city you can't gain everyone doing their own thing from in a city from the people because it, it doesn't so you can gain spiritedness from the people because that is in itself just one entity but you cannot gain an exchange of entities or the way that the way that sort of elements within you interact because that is that is not one thing it's a it's an interaction that may not make sense but you know hopefully it does uh so the passage 435e continues cities that have a reputation for spiritedness for example thrace or scythia must have developed this due to the spiritedness of individual citizens and the same goes for the love of learning associated with athens or the commercial instinct associated with the phoenicians and egyptians but do we do all these things with the whole soul or is it divided into different elements for the different characteristics or desires? The tripartite soul is based on the principle of non-contradiction. It is obvious that nothing can do two opposite things or be in two opposite states in the same part of itself at the same time in relation to the same object. He proves this with the example of a man being in motion and standing still at the same time. The, so, for example... You're standing still, but you're shaking your head. The the stillness is coming from a separate part of your body to the movement of the head. Um, in the same way, desires can be in opposition. Um, you may be thirsty, but refuse to drink. And therefore, the soul must have at least two elements. The part of the soul with which we think rationally, we can call the rational element. And the appetitive part is the irrational and desiring element. And in addition to these two elements, what about spirit? Socrates tells the story of Leontius, who wanted to look at dead bodies next to the public executioner, but also felt disgust. Eventually, he went to look and then shouted at himself in anger. And this shows that anger can be at war with your other desires. Um... And necessarily, there must be a third distinct element for spirit. Uh, so while they had previously counted the spirited element as desirous uh, in, within the appetitive part, they now realise that it is much more likely to support the rational element than the appetitive. Um, it's auxiliary to the rational element by nature. However, it is distinct from the rational element because babies can be spirited long before they develop rationality. Um, and therefore, there are three elements within the soul. That is how he decides this. They conclude that a person is wise in the same way when using the same part of himself, that the city is wise, um, and so on and so on with the other elements. So in the same way, a just person is just in the same way that a city is just. In that case, we must also remember that each one of us will be just and perform his own proper task when each of the elements within him is performing its proper task. So when someone is brought up appropriately, the spirited or rational elements will exercise control over the desiring element. Justice in a human is about the internal performance of man's own function, and about each element doing what is naturally suited to. Injustice in man is a civil war between the elements of their soul. And so which is more profitable? Obviously justice, because when the body's natural constitution is ruined, life seems not worth living. 
There is a single form of virtue and several forms of vice, of which four are worth mentioning. And these correspond to the five types of political regime and their corresponding souls. The type of regime that they have just described may be called either a monarchy or aristocracy, depending on how many individuals emerge as the ruler. However, this type of rule is the only just regime. And so just to clarify, the ruling class, so that the actual rulers um, of the city, those who were dubbed as coming from gold in the foundational story, they equate to the um, wisdom, rational element in human. And so naturally, the wisdom and rational element should rule our souls in the same way that the wise and ruling element of the city should rule that. <coughs> and then the rest of the guardian class, the majority, um, the soldiers, and who, those who were said to have come from the silver in the ground, they equate to the spirited element because, you know, it's fighting. And, and the spirited element naturally supports the rational element. Um, and so... Although it is only the rational element that rules, the spirited element helps it rule by its force and power. And then finally, the appetitive element, which he says must be controlled um, by our rationality. So our des you know, desires must be controlled by rationality. That is equates to the working class in the city, the, the, you know, the farmer, the shoemaker, the carpenter, and the argument is that justice in both the city and the individual is each person or each class of people in the city and each element of us in the human is justice is each of them doing its own thing, sticking in its lane, the ruler ruling, wisdom ruling, um, the working class doing their work and not questioning their their place in society in the same way that the appetitive part of our souls should just let itself be controlled by rationality. Um, and so it's a, it's a strong parallel that he makes. There, there are then questions to ask, you know, how much does he actually believe this and how much of it has he constructed in order to defend justice or define justice, you know? Does he believe that there are only three elements within the soul? What about faith? Is that is that part of rationality? Is that part of spirit, or is it something separate? You know, um, there are various other things that we do, which I think you could construe as being a fourth element in this in this sort of idea. But Plato limits it to the three, and the argument is, or well, the question is, is do, do these three elements and the and the limits does that is that because he wants to create a city with just the three classes is that why it's done it or does he actually believe it i mean that that's sort of up to debate 